<coughs> okay, welcome back. Um, before I get started, do you have any questions from yesterday? Something that popped up in your mind that you would like to come back to? No? Okay, so, um, so we discussed uh, how the Kigiri conditions are formed, what they are what they mean in some sense, like almost physically, you can get some good intuitions from that. Um, and what I should talk about now is the so-called second order sufficient condition, so SOSE. And uh, just to prepare your mind to what we have to discuss here, if we go back to the simple and constrained case, it's very trivial what we're talking about. Uh, if you have a simple, for example, scalar function, uh, we know that if the function is sufficiently differentiable, then the minimum is given by uh, the gradient of the function being zero. And that's what we discussed as a first order necessary condition. Uh, but you of course also need that the function is kind of going up around that point, which is uh, basically that the Hessian is uh, positive definite, right? So that's a first order condition and that's a second order condition. Um, and that's fairly trivial in this, uh, in the unconstrained case. Um, but uh, as soon as you throw in constraints in the problem, this picture, this, uh, the equi equivalent or generalization of this second, or second order conditions, uh, they become a little bit trickier. And um, there are a number of cases where people easily get confused about whether they actually have second order conditions or not. Uh, in some cases, even it it's not about the Hessian anymore. So um, we'll go through this a little bit. I'll make some example and examples and hope that it will help you uh, get a good sense of that. Okay, so if we go back again to this statement, so a kickity point, remember, it's a collection of three uh, objects, the primal and dual variables associated to inequality, inequality constraints, and we call this triplet the kickity point. I think if it satisfies uh, these conditions. Um, we have to assume a little bit of uh, smoothness or uh, differentiability on these functions. Uh, typically when you want to solve uh, NLPs uh, numerically, you want your functions to be at least twice differentiable. If you don't have that, uh, it may still work to call a solver on your problem, but it may be, uh, it may be struggling with uh, the problem. Um, can assume that the, this point is regular on top of uh, of being a KKD point. Then you know that uh, if W is an optimum, uh, then you must have this kind of KKD point. And we had this uh, concept of uh, the set of feasible directions. So if the point is regular, uh, this this is the same as the tangent cone, right? It's essentially telling you where you're allowed to move. Um, in order to try to improve your cost function. And um, the statement about second order uh, sufficient condition is essentially that uh, in that set here, uh, this F, there is no direction for which uh, the Hessian of the Lagrange function is uh, positive definite. So in that sense, uh, we have a fairly simple construction, um, but it's hiding a, a number of questions. Um, so maybe just to um, uh, capture a little bit better what we are talking about here, for example, if I did not have constraints, so my set F would be any directions you want, then D is anything you want, and what we're saying here is that uh, the gradient, uh, the deviation of the cost function is positive definite. If we didn't have constraints, uh, the Lagrange function would be the cost function. So here we recover to the extreme case, uh, this classic statement about unconstrained optimization that you essentially need the Hessian to be positive definite. If you have constraints, then you do all this construction and you have a number of things that make things more complex uh, than the unconstrained case. So you have this set F uh, given by this, uh, or defined by, by this uh, Jacobians. Uh, then you have to work in that set F with your directions D. So essentially that is saying that this Hessian does not need to be positive definite in every direction, 
but only in some specific ones defined by f and also defined by this funny thing here uh, it's not only that d must be in f it's also that on any constraint that is strictly active so we're talking about those hi's for which the multiplier is positive not zero but positive so it's these are constraints against which the solution is pushing right uh, this D's or the D's that you select must be in the null space of these constraints. So it's kind of as uh, I kind of hinted yesterday when you have strictly active inequality constraints, we should look at them as equality constraints. And these D's that you can uh, or that you should test against your Hessian, uh, uh, they must be uh, essentially in the tangent space or the tangent uh, yeah, to the, the active equality constraints. So if you had something like this, that's an H, and uh, the point is here, and it's kind of pushing against the, the constraint because mu is non-zero, then the Ds cannot be over here. They can only be in that tangent space. Uh, it turns out that once you apply these things properly, um, you managed to answer this SOSE question for pretty much any problem, uh, but you may get some, uh, some funny answers. So we'll repeat this, uh, this definitions here of what SOSE means. Um, yeah, so if you have uh, this strict inequality, you have a so-called strict SOSE, there's the difference between having uh, essentially a single minima and having something that looks more like this, for example, uh, with something, something flat here that would give you a, a full set of uh, um, solutions. So if you have only the, an inequality, a non-strict inequality here, then uh, you can talk about the weak SOSC, which means that the, your minimum is not necessarily locally unique. It could be like, for example, that, yeah, sorry. What's the abbreviation? SOSC, SOSC, second order sufficient condition. Yeah. So you, you have first order necessary condition. Mm -hmm. So it, you, you have to satisfy them um, to, uh, to get uh, a minimum. And uh, sufficient, if you satisfy this, then you know that you have a m uh, minimum. Yeah, that's an example. Huh? If you have, um, uh, for example, an unconstrained problem, uh, and it, you see that the minima are actually here. You have an entire set of x's here that would be uh, acceptable as the minima of the function. And unconstrained means that any of this point here, you could wiggle around the point the way you want. Um, but the problem here is that uh, the Hessian would be flat uh, on this part here. So your d transpose uh, nabla 2 phi d would be zero simply. Uh, so that will be a weak SOSC on this kind of problem. Um, another example, I mean, you don't actually need necessarily to have a full set of minima to have weak SOSC. So it's a completely trivial optimization problem, mean of x to the power 4, right? Solution is x is 0, but uh, your Hessian would be, so that's x4, 4x cubed, and that will be 12x squared, right? Uh, so the Hessian at uh, the solution, x0, is still 0, right? So it's at an even higher order that you start to see the curvature of the function, which means that when you build um, or you test the uh, SOSC on this problem, even though it's a very perfectly defined uh, minima, there's no, no problem with that, you still have weak SOSC, okay? So weak SOSC does not necessarily imply that you have multiple solutions. Uh, it just means that your problem does not look like a quadratic locally, essentially. Okay. Okay, let's move to <coughs> slightly more uh, complex examples. Um, here is, so I'm gonna like sketch some uh, problems where I always have a cost function and some constraints, and I want to unpack 
these definitions on, on each of these examples and show you what happens. Um, and of course, I created the problems such that something interesting happens. So for example, here, uh, that's my cost function here. So you can see that it has a, a very clear curvature along that direction, right? But then you have this valley here, this red line. Uh, all these points are at the same level, right? See that in the level curves as well. So all these points uh, are the minimum of my cost. So according to the cost, all these points are uh, valid as solutions, and then, then the function is curving up this way, right? And then here I add uh, an equality constraint, this thing here. So the solution has to be on this line, uh, which basically brings the solution of my problem here, right? Um, the solution is, uh, is unique. I cannot go here or there, right? And if I try to move that point along the line, I will actually climb up the function, right? So that's no problem with that point. It's a, it's a clear minimum. I'm claiming that if you apply this properly, then you would see that SOSE holds on that point. It has second order uh, sufficient condition, even though uh, the Hessian of the cost function is, uh, is zero along that uh, red line. Uh, and it's not too hard to build in this case, so you basically uh, at least assume regularity at that point. And if you have that, you can build this uh, set F. Uh, that's the tangent to the constraint at that point. Right? And then you assess the curvature of your cost function along that line alone, right? You don't care about the other directions because that's the only direction where you can move. Um, and can you guess, can you guess what happens um, along that line, the function is curved up. And so, in this specific example, I don't need to care about these uh, strange things. We'll come back to that in a bit, because I don't have inequality constraints. So I'm just focusing on my set F. The directions would be essentially anything that is in F, not zero, obviously. Otherwise, it would be a bit obviously zero here. Um, and I just assess the curvature along this line. So no problem here even though my cost is flat in some directions. Okay with that? Let's make another example. Um, same cost function, I'll stick to that. Same constraint, but I make it an inequality constraint now, right? Uh, so I'm allowed to move anywhere I want uh, in that part, and I'm not allowed to go over there. Um, this uh, would be a candidate solution. Right, this point is okay, cannot go here. Uh, but I would be allowed to go here, right, along this line. There is no problem with that. Um, now you can, from the intuitions I gave you yesterday, I hope you can uh, easily understand that the multiplier associated with that constraint is zero at this point. Uh, why? Because the cost function is happy about this entire line and it's not pushing against the constraint, right? You'll be pushing against the constraint if um, if, for example, the function had some slope uh, going against the constraint, right? In that case, uh, this would be a solution, but I could go away from that constraint and the cost would not want to push back because this entire line is, uh, is the minimum of the function. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. SOAC fails in that case. Um, if you apply the definition, uh, so your set F, now it's an in inequality constraint. I have to check uh, all the directions that um, combine with the, grad yeah, the gradient of the constraint uh, are zero or less than zero. Uh, so that gives me this entire uh, region here, half space, right? And um, now I need to check this thing here, right? It's essentially saying uh, I need to restrict my directions to be the null space of the Jacobian if the constraint is strictly active. But here my constraint is weakly active, right? The multiplier is zero. So I can dismiss that condition. So essentially I can test my directions in this entire uh, half space. So my Ds are essentially this entire space. And then if I start to build quadratic forms with, uh, with these Ds, I can find some uh, which are zero. Uh, for example, uh, this one. So in that case, uh, you fail SOSC because you can find 
points, or at least strict as so I see, because you can find directions for which uh, this Hessian is um, zero. Okay, with that. Okay, yet another example. By, by the way, it's kind of uh, or, uh, telling you something about this point being okay, but not being the unique solution, right? So I see fails in that case because I could move away from the constraint and still be at an equally valid uh, minimum. <coughs> All right, another example. I changed the cost function a bit now. Um, so it's curved up here and curved down here, right? It's actually non-convex along that direction. See that? So you have essentially a saddle point here. And uh, you could go down this, uh, uh, this path uh, towards the minimum and towards the minimum the other side. And uh, again, I go back to uh, an equality constraint here. So I have to be on that line, on that curve. And uh, in these conditions, the minimum is essentially here. So it's as low as possible on that function, provided that you have to be on that line, right? Um, and here we can see actually, uh, so at this point, the, the cost has a gradient pushing in that direction. But that's an equality constraint, so it will basically block the point on that line. Um, and that's actually quite interesting. So you have this effect in uh, constraint optimization that you, you actually may be working with a, a non-convex cost function like here. Right, yeah, it it's has negative curvature in some directions, and still have uh, completely okay, uh, a completely okay problem in the sense of having uh, second order conditions being positive definite. So I'm claiming that's the case here, uh, SOSC holds. And if you look at this uh, at this definition properly, you would conclude that uh, your Hessian uh, in the directions that are acceptable is still positive uh, definite. So it's the same story as before. The set F is the tangent uh, to the constraint. It's an equality constraint. Uh, the directions D are these guys here. And if you restrict your tests along that direction, uh, along that direction, the cost function looks uh, curved up, if you want. So there's no problem with that. Uh, if you release that constraint, then, uh, of course, you will start looking at these directions as well and you would see something uh, negatively, negatively curved. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, same story, but now I turn my um, equality constraint into an inequality constraint, so I can move along this. Um, and I claim that in this case, uh, SOSC still holds. And you have to note that, again, at that point, you have some gradient. The function is pushing down that line. Um, and so it's pushing against the constraint. So from the intuitions of yesterday, uh, your multiplier is positive. Right? So the solution is pushing against the constraint. So if we test SOSC, again, uh, the set F of directions that are acceptable. So I'm applying this bit here. It's this entire thing here, right? So that's the set F of admissible directions. Uh, and um, if I could test along all these directions, I could test that one. And along this direction here, the cost is, uh, is curved negatively. So it may sound that SOSC should not hold. However, you need to apply this bit now. Uh, so we have an active inequality constraint with a non-zero multiplier. Uh, so it's strictly active. So that restricts my directions again to uh, only this part of the set F. So again, this inequality constraint, because it's strictly active, you could look at it as inequality constraint. And in this test at least, and, uh, and you would conclude that the SOSC holds. Along this line, the function is curved up. Right? Any question on this? So if you, you, have, you end up with an optimization problem where you're a bit puzzled because you may have um, 
yeah, directions in your cost function that have negative curvatures, not convex stuff, and you wonder a little bit, uh, do I have SOSC or not? Go back to a proper definition and construction and things uh, should become clear. Um, there's one thing I, uh, I brushed a little bit over in what I said. Uh, I talked about the cost function here. Uh, the test applies to the Hessian of the, of the Lagrange function, of course. And if your constraints are nonlinear, they will contribute uh, a bit in this Lagrange function. Huh? If you remember, since L is, for example, this, if I have only um, equality constraints, so when I take the Hessian of my Lagrange function, that's the Hessian of the cost, but also the Hessian of, uh, of this scalar product. So this thing will bring in some curvature into your, uh, your Hessian of the Lagrange function and will have an impact on that as well. So it's not just about the cost, but uh, it's useful to simplify to that uh, in explaining. Okay with that? Uh, maybe one last example. Uh, sometimes people are a bit puzzled about SOSC second order conditions on LPs because everything is linear in an LP. There is no curvature to speak of, right? So uh, I've heard people saying, oh, but there is no SOSC on LPs. That's not true. I mean, if you apply this definition properly, you do have. Uh, and what is going on is, for example, this case here, that's a very trivial LP. Um, the cost wants to bring W to higher values, but you're blocked by that constraint. So that this, that's the solution, right? And you can test SOSC uh, at that point. Essentially, you have uh, one constraint. It's active because uh, you're pushing against the constraints. You have a mu greater than zero. Um, and what will happen? So you can test all your, your, your F is basically this, uh, this direction here. But then you also need to respect this condition. <coughs> and since u is uh, greater than 0, so you have essentially to select a d that is in the null space of that constraint, and that uh, prevents you from moving that point at all. So essentially, again, if you look at this as uh, an equality constraint, because it's a strictly active inequality constraint, you would conclude that this point is blocked. So your set of d that you can test is actually empty. Right, which means that this condition uh, is trivially satisfied in some sense. And that's true of any LP, um, whoops, any LP where uh, the point is uh, blocked against the constraints by the gradient of the um, cost function. Um, you will always have SOSC at this point. Can you think of uh, an LP where SOSC would fail? It's not trivial. No. <laughs> okay. Um, can try to sketch one on the board. Um, imagine you have uh, you had a, have a polytope of some kind, and. Uh, let's say that um, the gradient of the cost function is pushing you that way, okay? Um, then uh, you want your solution to be, um, let's see, no, nah, that doesn't work. Uh, let's put it that way. Yeah, that should be better. Um, so then you want to be down at that point Right, but um, that constraint. Maybe <laughs> I'm making an example that uh, is not gonna work very well. Uh, okay, let's make something simple. Imagine the gradient of the cost is zero, right? So the cost is C transpose X in the LP, put C in the cost. It's not pushing ag against any constraints, right? So. At in, if you have that, any point is valid. You could choose it here, for example. But then uh, this condition is never satisfied. You can always uh, pick directions 
that moves you away from the constraint because it's not act not strictly active, and then um, you can find directions that have zero curvature, essentially. Um, but yeah, essentially, what happens in LPs anytime the gradient of the cost is not pushing against the constraint, and uh, the solution does not fall in a corner where it has to be there because of the gradient, then you have SOSC failures. And that typically happens, oops, we'll see that a bit later, but if you, if you play with LPs and you introduce some parameters in there, you typically the solution uh, sticking in one corner, and as you change the problem, at some point it will flip to another corner, right? I don't know if you have seen that before. When you flip, SOSC fails at exactly that point when you flip, because you have to move from strictly active constraints to uh, not strictly active ones. We'll get to that. All right, um, very useful concept uh, when you treat, nu treat numerics is the so-called reduced Hessian. Um, and that's a fairly simple idea. Um, so let's say you collect uh, all these gradients. So the gradients of the um, equality constraints and the strictly active uh, inequality constraints, right? All these things that um, uh, are blocking the solution in some sense. And you form um, the null space Z of this uh, matrix. Um, yeah. And then you kind of uh, project in some sense your Hessian into that null space. You form Z transpose Hessian Z. Uh, that's the reduced Hessian. Uh, and it's essentially saying uh, that is kind of a basis of where you're allowed to go with your problem, right? Uh, any combination of the Z times some uh, new, for example, is zero. So any of these vector is in the null space of A. Um, and so when you do that, you're essentially describing all these directions where you're allowed to move um, with your uh, point W. So essentially building uh, this set uh, D in some, or the, all the Ds that you can choose in some sense in a systematic way. Um, and if you have strict SOSC at your solution, then this reduced Hessian will be uh, positive definite. Um, it's not very hard to prove uh, you can check that offline. Uh, and we often use that rather than uh, making these complex, complex tests as I showed you before. It's very hard to do that if you have uh, large problems. If you want to check if uh, something is wrong with your solution, you can simply build that, this null space, the reduced Hessian, and then you test the eigenvalues of this guy. Um, and uh, if they are all positive, then you're good to go. Okay with that? It's so reduced Hessian, it's uh, also something you find quite often in, li in the literature. Um, people uh, discuss this object in a number of contexts. Okay, um, a few words about this. I, I will have a chapter or a lecture on parametric NLPs. So we'll come back to these things. I just want to prepare you a little bit. Um, and uh, what I'm after here is uh, something that is used an awful lot uh, when you do advanced optimal control optimization. So uh, we have discussed um, NLPs in, uh, in that form, right? Maybe with some constraints. and inequality constraints. And you can solve that and you get your solution and uh, you get an optimal cost out of this. Um, but what people care a lot at some point about is, okay, what if we have some uh, parameters inside the NLP and these parameters may change and we want to resolve the NLP for different types of parameters or understand what is the impact of these parameters on the NLP, on the cost, on the solution, on the, on the dual solution, and so on. So in that case, your cost becomes a function of P, right? 
as well as uh, w star becomes a function of p and also your primal and dual variables uh, become a function of p. You good with that? Um, turns out that uh, if we have the very classic conditions like CQS, OSC, you actually can discuss uh, the sensitivities of this function with respect to p. So even though this is a completely implicit problem, you need uh, numerics to compute the solution, you can anyway compute to arbitrary precision uh, the derivatives, for example, of these things with respect to p, first order, second order, all the way up to uh, how far your functions are differentiable in here. And that's extremely useful in a number of contexts. So that's um, what I wanted to discuss a little bit. Uh, so one first thing that is very typically uh, commented about is uh, the role of the multipliers uh, in that picture. The way you can look at it is uh, if you look at the purely equality constrained optimization problem, so I just have a G here, um, and I will consider a disturbance of my constraints, so I change from G to G plus B, right? Uh, so your KKD conditions uh, become this. If you change B, then you will change the solution like the W star and lambda star. You will change the cost as well, of course. Uh, and what happens is if you have SOSC, second order sufficient condition, then the derivative of the cost with respect to B is actually your multiplier. Um, may sound a bit abstract here, uh, but what this means in some sense is that the multiplier attached to a constraint is actually telling you what is the price of having that, having that constraint. I.e., uh, if I impose some constraint on my problem and let's say I, I reduce it a bit, uh, an example would be, well, op let's optimize this process and uh, but I want that at the end I don't have more CO2 production than X, okay? Like that would be a constraint on the process. And then you ask, okay, but what is the price of having this constraint? What if I, re if I increase or um, allow more CO2 production, right? Uh, the question you're asking is, what if I change my constraint a bit? And the answer to that question is in lambda. It's telling you if you change this, uh, this uh, condition a little bit, here is the price or the, the cost you gain, right? So if you wonder what is, uh, after you solve your problem, you wonder, okay, how much did I pay for my different constraints? Essentially, it's somehow to a first order approximation embedded in your multipliers, right? It would tell you what, how much uh, each constraint uh, is impacting um, your problem. Um, maybe to expand on that, uh, for example, if you have an optimization problem that takes its solution here, and let's imagine you had an equality constraint on top of that, but you're lucky that uh, this constraint was compatible with your uh, the minimum of the cost, right? So the, 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 the absolute minimum of the cost is acceptable for the constraint. If you're in this situation, you can guess again from the interpretation we had yesterday of the Kegiri condition that uh, the multiplier attached to your constraint would be zero, right? There is no, the, the constraint is not pulling or pushing on the point because the point is already at the lowest point of the valley, so it's not um, changing that point in any way. And what this tells you in that context is that this constraint has no price. You could remove it, it would not change anything, right? So that's the interpretation of the lambda being zero. <coughs> if H, or if that was an inequality constraint, for example, something like this, that would not change the picture. Mu would be zero, and I would also tell you, well, you, you have a fence in your problem, but it's not blocking the point, so it does not have any price, right? And same story if you had an inequality constraint that was inactive, again, mu would be zero, 
and that's again telling you I don't care about this constraint, it's not impacting on my cost, you could move it, it would not make any difference. Okay with that? Yeah, so the multipliers are actually containing a lot of information about your constraints. And if you want to have a quick assessment of which constraints in your problem are the most expensive, uh, just look at the multipliers. Yeah, that's something I uh, did not talk about too much. Um, when you build a Lagrange function, you can, uh, yeah, it's not written here, but the, you, you can do plus the scalar products or minus. Uh, so the lambda transpose G, you can do plus minus. It does not change uh, the solution. It does not change most of the construction, but if you change the signs, you have signs uh, changing in a few places in the construction. Uh, so it's actually uh, fairly common, for example, in convex optimization that people tend to do use minus and in non-convex tend people tend to use plus. Uh, so just be careful. If you have a doubt with the signs, just uh, look very carefully uh, about what you're doing. Um, but yeah, usually it's a simple thing. Okay with that? Yeah. Okay, maybe a quick summary. Um, on uh, uh, the optimality conditions. Huh? Um, yeah. So first order condition. Um, you need to read them in the right way. I insisted a bit on that. It, they never say that, oh, if you find a KKD point, then you have a local optima. That's not what it said. All it said is that uh, a point that is a local optima and regular is a KKD point. Okay. So that's the way the implication goes. And just remember that when you call a solver on your problem, this solver is trying to solve these conditions, hoping that somehow this logic will make it reversible. So once it found a KKD point, it will be also a local optimum. But that's really not uh, guaranteed. Uh, second order condition, the Hessian of the Lagrange function is positive in all feasible directions. Um, and by that we mean this f, so all directions are acceptable, uh, but you cannot move out of strictly active inequality constraints. Um, yeah, if you have non-convex problems, you don't necessarily get the global optimum, um, but you can also have non-convex problems um, with a unique minimum. Uh, very stupid example is this one. This function is, uh, is non-convex, for example, here. Between these two points, the function is above, but I still have a unique minimum. So non-convexity does not necessarily imply that you have multiple uh, minima. Uh, a local optimum may not be a KKD point. You also need irregularity. And a KKD point may not be a local optimum. You also need some more conditions. And so this lack of equivalence has to do with the regularity in SOSC. So that's why I insisted a bit on these concepts. You okay with that? Um, yeah, a few more remarks on constraint qualifications. Um, so I mentioned LICQ, linear independence constraint qualification, as the most trivial form of so-called constraint qualification that was essentially saying that uh, these gradients have to be uh, linearly independent. And this condition is super easy to check, right? You just take your solution, evaluate these gradients, check if they are uh, full rank. If not, you have a problem. Uh, LICQ gives you regularity, but you may not have LICQ and still have regularity. And that's uh, what we mean when we say that there are more constraint qualifications. So LICQ is what we uh, saw but you have a number of them, for example, this MFCQ. Uh, I actually don't fully remember uh, how they work. The other ones, you can read that offline. Um, you have a number of things uh, that you can apply. Um, Slatter is very useful for uh, convex problems because it's also very easy to check. Uh, you essentially n only need that um, uh, you have an interior to your feasible domain. So 
essentially if you have uh, some uh, active inequality constraint, you have to be able to back away from it. Uh, for example, you cannot accept to have another inequality constraint that blocks uh, your point like this. Uh, so this one is easy. Those are a bit harder to check and in the, nu in the numerics they are not so much used, I would say. So most solvers would assume you have a lie CQ, otherwise there's a number of things that are a bit complex to handle. And you have some solvers that accept uh, non, or to accept that the problem phase a lie CQ and uh, uh, qualifies at something higher. Uh, but they are typically not very standard, not very optimized and so on. Uh, so the best is if you can write a problem that has a lie CQ and, um, and then everything will be fine. And it may not really not be obvious how you write a problem that satisfies a lie CQ. It takes a bit of experience actually to recognize what kind of constraints will create problems. Any question on that? Have you seen these things, these different conditions? No? Okay, it was good to discuss them then. Yeah, okay, a uh, few last words before I move on. Uh, so it's back to this question of if I have parameters in my NLP and I want to know what is the effect of changing these parameters uh, on the solution and cost function. So here is uh, an example, uh, so parametric NLP. So you minimize over W, but you have a given P at which you do that, right? So you could imagine uh, you plug your P in, uh, in the computer, solve the problem, you get a cost function, you get a solution W, solve for another P, you get something different. So in, in many ways, uh, your cost and also the solution W and the multipliers, they are all functions of uh, these parameters. And the question is essentially, so what does it look like, this uh, function v, the optimum of the problem? It's a scalar. Uh, one question could be, well, is it differentiable? Is it continuous? Is it smooth? And so on and so forth. Why do we need that? It's used a lot, for example, in bi-level optimization. And uh, that's one place where we use that a lot. Um, an example of... Uh, Actually, a few papers that we published not long ago around this would be uh, if you have um, cars crossing an intersection, right? And we talk a lot about uh, autonomous driving nowadays, right? So let's say that you have uh, three cars that want to cross an intersection. They have to share this space. They cannot collide, right? And each car wants to drive, for example, minimizing fuel and maximizing uh, passenger comfort. So in some sense, you can think that every car has, has its own NLP that is just trying to do that, uh, minimize fuel consumption and so on. The car would like to just cross the intersection disregarding the other cars. And each of them has an NLP. Uh, maybe one of them is actually a truck. Uh, that's a different NLP, it has more mass and everything, it's harder to break and so on. So if you just let them go, they crash, but now you want them to negotiate on how they use this space. In that context, uh, the parameters could, for example, be uh, the times when they go in and out of the intersection, right? When am I going to cross these two lines? This, this is a parameter of the NLP. If you constrain the car to enter and leave the intersection at specific times, this is uh, an extra constraint in the problem that is parameterized by these times. And the car will have a price for doing that. Uh, if you ask me to, to uh, step on the brake, stop and restart, that's expensive in terms of fuel, especially if I'm a truck, for example. Uh, so these are parametric NLPs. And the way you could resolve that, that's one way we propose, is uh, you essentially look at all these things as parametric NLPs. They have crossing times and uh, you have something at a higher level that negotiates with the cars uh, about these crossing times. And the way you do that is you assess uh, what is the, how will the cost change for each car if we change the crossing times. And the way you, you understand that is via this kind of sensitivity analysis. You okay with that? So that's just an example of, um, of uh, why we use that. By level optimization, it's used in a number of topics. <coughs>
Uh, and the answer to that question is yes, under some conditions, as is usual. Uh, and uh, the condition looks like this. this the cost function of the NLP, prioritized in P, is differentiable if there is no weakly active constraint. I told you yesterday that this notion of weakly active constraint will come up a lot, and uh, that's an example where it happens. It's differentiable, and actually the derivative of the cost function is very, trivially, very uh, trivial to compute. You just need to take the derivative of your Lagrange function with the parameters. I'm not talking about the total derivative, just the partial derivative. So you take the Lagrange function, this expression, differentiate that with respect to P, evaluate that at your uh, 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 solution W star, lambda star, mu star, and you get uh, the gradient of the cost. So very cheap to evaluate, very simple to build. Uh, yeah, I will show you why, uh, what happens when you have weak life active constraints. Uh, a linear program is very useful to do that. That's an LP. So the, the cost is essentially pulling the point down here. So you can like, it's like a slope like this, right? And I have a polytope that constrains my uh, point. And the parameters, I'm not showing you how they enter, but they will actually kind of uh, move around this, uh, this cost function, like the, the gradient will uh, basically shift around as P changes. So I have here a scalar P, and that's the cost associated to different P's. You get that picture, yeah? And if I move P a little bit, here is what happens. Uh, so you see that changing the cost inside the NLP will also change the, the minimum. Here actually the point is not moving at all, right? it's blocked in the constraints. Uh, so changing the cost is just changing V uh, by a direct effect. And then I'm getting to this point and that's what I mentioned before about SOSC. So you see that the, the gradient of, of the cost is basically rotating that way. So this point is about to jump from this corner to that corner. See that coming? And you also see maybe coming a little bit of a corner on the cost function as well. Right, so when I jump from one corner to the next, it's, this one is not very obvious, but there is actually a break in the cost. And what happened there is precisely at the moment when this point jumps from here to there, this constraint here, it became weakly active. At some point, the gradient is not pushing against that constraint anymore. And uh, the, the next P, it's rotated slightly so that it's going to push against that one. At this specific point, this guy jumps here. And in, in order to be able to jump, in some sense, this constraint has to release the point. And the mu associated with that thing will have to become zero. So when you have this jump in an LP, one constraint becomes weak to active. And at this point, SOSC fails. Same here, when I'll go ro over this, uh, this uh, jump, or essentially, or this, uh, this angle here, it's gonna be a jump from here to down, yeah. But it's quite amazing that the, uh, the, this V is still continuous, even though the point may be completely jumping around uh, the feasible domain, right? Here it went from up here to down here, it did not make the, the cost function discontinuous. It just made it, its, uh, its gradient uh, discontinuous. Okay with that? Why did it jump all the way? Um, yeah, I param parameterized the, the cost function uh, in a bit of a funny way to make interesting things happen. So what happens is that here uh, the cost is pushing there. And then it's kind of rotating this way. It's like you're moving the, like a plate that goes around like this. Yeah. yeah, it's not very clear in the, it's not very easy to <laughs> display everything you need to display. But the, the green arrow is showing you a little bit what is going on. So that's the gradient of the cost. Now it's reducing and it's almost flat here. And then it jumps on the other side. Cool. Uh, and we can play with the same stuff, but now instead of talking about uh, 
the mean of the problem. I'm talking about the arg mean, so the argument that minimizes the problem. So I'm talking about the primal solution W. And you can ask the same questions. Uh, maybe I'll finish with this slide and we take a break, right? Yeah. Um, the same questions, huh? Uh, how is W changing with P and is it differentiable? If it's differentiable, again, we can play with, uh, for example, bi-level optimization, but uh, these kind of things have multiple applications, including uh, robust optimization, real-time MPC, and so on and so forth. So we use that in uh, almost everywhere. Uh, as usual, answer is yes, it's differentiable under some conditions, and they are actually a bit more demanding than for the cost function. You also need no weekly active constraints, but you also need LICQ and SOSC. If you don't have that, uh, you have uh, non-differentiability in your um, solution manifold. And that's an example. Here it's uh, a full uh, NLP. Uh, I'm not showing you what it is. I think we'll look at it at some point later. You have one parameter and your two solutions, W1, W2. And you see uh, a nice smooth manifold and then you have something dramatic happening here. And um, you can move around uh, your P and getting corresponding solutions. You can evaluate uh, this gradient. I'm not showing you yet how, I'll show you later. And you get uh, essentially the tangent to uh, the manifold of solutions. And here I'm reporting I have one uh, inequality constraint in the problem. Uh, at the moment it's, it's negative, so it's not active. And as you proceed, uh, you see that we are getting close to that uh, strange point and you may guess now what happened in between is that my constraint uh, became active. So here on that side it's inactive. As soon as the constraint becomes active, I have this dramatic uh, uh, non-differentiability in the solution manifold. Okay. Um, so when you have a change of active set, so a constraint changing from not active to active, then you typically have a, uh, a point where the gradient does not exist. You have subgradients, right? So you could take the limit to the left and the limit to the right, and everything would be fine. You could compute that. But just when you jump over that point, you have a change in, the, in these gradients. Okay with that? If we take a break, and uh, then we'll talk about Newton.